know, there are only a handful of things that you would really consider essentials in life. Uh, probably the ones that come to mind the first are, you know, food, shelter, and uh, clothing. Um, but there are a few more. Relationships are essential. We've learned that certainly over the, the past few months, that, uh, that relationships really are, are crucial. And we're sort of still in that where we're, yes, we're meeting in a church, but uh, you know, we're still sort of restricted as far as our, our meetings outside and, and all those sorts of things. So uh, relationships are very important. Another essential thing, in my opinion anyway, is, is love. Nat King Cole rightly sung, uh, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. You know, one overlooked essential to life that we often don't put on that list is hope. A neuroscientist Tali Sharat argues that hope is essential to survival and that it is hardwired into our brains and argues actually that it can be the difference between living a healthier life versus one that's trapped in despair. In fact, there was a, a neurologist and a psychiatrist named Viktor Frankl who was a, a Jewish man who was uh, put into a concentration camp back in uh, World War II. And when he was in the various concentration camps, not only was he doing the work that he was forced to do, but while he was doing it, he was making psychological observations about uh, the people that were around them. And uh, what he was observing was their different mindsets and how they played a part in how, whether or not they survived. And what he ended up concluding was that the people who had something to hold on to, something to look forward to, or some sort of hope that they would cling to would be more likely to survive if they, had, if they weren't executed. Those that were hopeless, those that had nothing to hold on to, had a much higher chance of passing away early. In his flagship book, The Man's Search for Meaning, this is what Viktor Frankl wrote. He said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how, meaning any situation where we would ask, how in the world could this happen to me? His recommendation was to choose hope. This is what he continued to write. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude at any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Perhaps you're lacking hope today. Perhaps you are weary for many reasons. It's been a long year. But as we come closer to the end of 2020, it is crucial that we finish strong. It's vital that we end the year with hope. And I'm not talking about just a hope that, that is looking forward to the next few months where hopefully we can get back to life as, as we once knew it and everything can be back to, to normal again because the issue is, like, say everything goes back to normal in March or April or May or whenever it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen, we're going to quickly find out that new issues are going to rise up. And then we're going to be frustrated with those issues, and we're going to be looking for a new hope. And when those things wear out, then something else will come up. There's always a searching for something. We live in a world that's filled with all kinds of troubles. We have more than enough professionals to tell us how to put band-aids on our problems, but we have very little to offer for long-term solutions. The weary world, however, can rejoice at Christmas time, and not just this season, but from now on, because Christ has come to redeem you. In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah pointed God's people to the hope that would come in Jesus 600 years or so after he prophesied. In Isaiah's day, it certainly had its share of issues. Two to three hundred years before Isaiah had prophesied, the nation of Israel had split into two different uh, nations, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. 
Israel would be a nation that would never have a king that was obedient uh, to the Lord. Rather, their leadership would always direct them to pagan worship and pagan practices and some serious national moral issues. In 722 BC, God sent the Assyrians to Israel to conquer it. And indeed they did. Those that survived were scattered throughout the entire Middle East, and Israel as a a nation, it's different than what we know now, but the tribes would never come back together in the way that they were before this. For the nation of Judah, though they had a number of kings who loved the Lord and pointed uh, their people to God, many of them led the nation astray. And about 130 years or so after the northern tribes were completely decimated and wiped out, Judah was on the road to the same destruction for the same reasons. And Isaiah now is sent to Judah to talk some sense into the people of Judah. Isaiah was well aware, however, that the people would not listen And so in Isaiah chapter 8, God speaks through Isaiah starting in verse 7. This is what he says. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all of his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks. And it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. So in other words, Isaiah is saying to his his people, buckle up and put a helmet on because it's it's going to get real here. But then he gives a hope to those whose hope is truly in the Lord. In verse 12, he says, Do not call conspiracy all that the people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts Him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So you look at that and things seem pretty gloomy for Judah. And we're obviously not in a situation as dire and as desperate as Judah was at this time, but we can certainly agree that we are in a season of gloom. But Isaiah, and just as he says in in chapter 8 that uh, he is giving a warning, he also gives a hope. One called Emmanuel. God with us. That he is coming And he will be the king that not only they have looked for, but he will reign through suffering and he will reign through loss, taking the sins of his people upon him. And it is that background now that Isaiah 9 emerges emerges from. So there are two things that we need to consider this morning with Isaiah chapter 9. And the first is, is that we need to live in the reality of the hope of Jesus. Live in the reality of the hope of Jesus. It's in times like these that we're living in for various reasons that we can easily default into despair. Isaiah calls it gloom. And I did a Google search on gloom and how often it's been used over the past 200 years. And gloom is not a word that we use very often anymore. It means partial or complete darkness. The sky can be gloomy, but Isaiah here is not talking about the gloom of the weather. 
You've probably known or maybe you have been a person who has maybe been a time or two in a gloomy mood. But Isaiah is not referring to temperaments here. Rather, this is a gloom of the soul. It's more than a mindset. It is a modus operandi. It is how we function. It is how we view the world. It is a constant state of depression and hopelessness. It is a terrible malady, but something that is so easy to fall into. It's easy to get cynical and say that our our best days are behind us and that whatever is in front of us is just drudgery. But it's here that Isaiah makes an interesting thesis. In verse 1, he says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Now that seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Anguish is a strong word. And indeed, for the people of Judah and and many of us, we are in anguish. However, there is no gloom for us. There is no hopelessness for those who trust in God. Why? Verse 1 continues. For in the former time, he brought in contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So that is that God is up to something. And God is up to something that is glorious and different and good. He is going to shine a light on those who are not just of the tribe of Judah, but rather he is going to shine throughout the entire world. Something is going to happen in which the light of God is going to reach the Gentiles in Asia and Africa and Europe and the Americas and all over the entire world. God is coming to them. And it's this, uh, this language is very interesting. He is telling the people something that is to come, yet notice that he is talking as if it's already happened. But that's how faith works. Waiting in faith and hope, but living as if it is already ours. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Those who have walked in a way of life that is dark and distant from God, they can see a light. The word deep darkness there literally means shadow of darkness, which uh, is very reminiscent of Psalm 23. This is for those who are crumbling under the weight of calamities. You see, when we, we can choose to live in gloom, you can see gloom as the only reality. But Isaiah is pointing his listeners and us to something greater. Verse 3 gives them a better vision of a better reality that God offers. He says, you, and he's talking to, he's talking to God here, so... God, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. In in other words, God is doing work and something that brings people into his family. He has done something that promises an increase of joy, a joy that will never let us down and and never comes to an end. And verse 4 shows us how he does it. And it's through deliverance for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder. The rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. Notice how much this language points back to the Exodus. When God's people were enslaved by Pharaoh, when God delivered the people from their yoke of slavery, but now this yoke is no longer carried on the backs of God's people because this yoke of suffering is now on God's shoulders. The yoke of his burden refers to the suffering that he endured. The rod of his oppressors refers to the suffering that was inflicted upon him. 
He is pointing towards something that is coming in which God will bear the suffering of his people at the hands of others. But the suffering will bring enjoyment. Look in verse 5. Describes the results, the fruits of victory. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle and tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. All right. First of all, you look at this and say, wow, those are some pretty violent statements there. But keep in mind what it's pointing to here is God is going to get the victory through his loss and through his suffering. And when it's done, it allows us who are weak and frail to enter in to his victory. And so that vision that Isaiah is putting forward for us is a reality which, yes, life can be very tough. But those difficulties no longer have the last word. There is a hope that God has done something about our gloom. God has done something about our mistakes that we are continuing to live with the guilt from. God has done something about relationships that are broken. God has done something about the depression and the anxiety that we face every day. He has done something with the physical pain that we deal with every day. He has provided deliverance through his own suffering. And it brings everlasting joy and deliverance to those who see the light and who trust in it. The question is, which reality is dominating your life? Is your reality dominated by your struggles? Or is it dominated by the grace and the hope and the mercy and the joy and the deliverance in Jesus Christ. He came in human form. He took on flesh and came to the world that he created at Christmas. And it gives the weary world a reason to rejoice. So that's the first thing we need to do is live in the reality of Jesus. But secondly, we should receive the object of hope. Jesus. Receive the object of hope. What Isaiah does between chapters 8 and chapter 9 here is, is, is really quite stunning. He is speaking in chapter 8 to a people who have misplaced hope. He is speaking to people who have put their, their hope in, in uh, their idols And he is speaking to people that have put their hope in governmental power. The nation of Judah had formed unhealthy alliances with uh, neighboring nations with the hope that when they come into trouble, that those nations would come and, and rescue them when they were threatened. And we're not too different than that. Yeah, we might not, we might not uh, rely on other nations to come and rescue us. But many of us, even in the church, have way too much trust in having the right leaders in office and having the right justices on the bench. But just as Isaiah tells Judah that uh, trusting in uh, the power of governments is an affront to the Lord, verses 6 through 7, he says uh, and tells the people that God is going to deliver his people through a king, through a government. But no government that we know of. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And this kingdom, Isaiah tells us, will not come through, through some military power. It will not come through some military might, but rather it will come through a baby. Look at verse 6. For to us, a child is born. 
To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. See, now when we look at, at, at this verse here, we have to remember what the emphasis is here. The emphasis in this particular sentence is not on us. For to us a child is born, but rather the emphasis in the sentence is on the child. For to us a child is born. And observing the context, we can surmise that this child will indeed be human and that it will be uh, born into a royal line. He is born of a woman, yet given by God. The burden of his rule will be extensive. It says the government will be on his shoulders. There's no need for a defense department. There's no need for a commerce department or an education department. The government will be on his shoulders. When Isaiah says in verse 6, his name shall be called, it's not talking about a proper noun. Oftentimes in Scripture, The Lord is given titles, and those titles are referred to as his name. For example, God is his title. Yahweh is his name. God is not a name. It is a title. When you look at the the name Jesus Christ, that's not his first and last name. Christ is the title. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And his name in this instance is the summary of his character. And his character is compelling. He is first a wise leader. Look what it says. It says that he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. His wisdom is one of the qualifications that he has for this this office of king over all. Further, Isaiah refers to him as Mighty God. This refers to one who would come that would have limitless power. The power of God behind him. This is not a power which is abused, which so often happens in our worldly government. But he rather is a leader that is relational. Look what it also calls him. The everlasting father. That's not to say that he is going to come and have biological children. Or even for Jesus as our, he's not our spiritual father, he is our brother. God is our, God the Father is our father. But rather what it's pointing to here is that Isaiah's uh, king that he's describing would have a perfect relationship with his subjects. It is how he relates to others. And because he is wise, because he is mighty, because he is perfectly relational, he creates a society that is characterized by peace. And because his subjects would follow his lead, he is called the prince of peace. And this kingdom is ever expanding. Look in verse, uh, verse 7. Of the increase of his government... And of peace there will be no end. Uh, This kingdom in Isaiah's age is obviously looking forward to another day. Because this one would come and establish his kingdom. Look what it continues to say. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness... From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, I don't think that Isaiah and his hearers would have had a clue about how this was going to work itself out. But when we look at biblical prophecy especially in the Old Testament, we need to bear in mind that there was often an immediate fulfillment of what the prophet is talking about, and then a final fulfillment, a greater fulfillment of what they're pointing to. And it wasn't long that after Isaiah had prophesied uh, this, that Judah was ransacked by the Babylonians, and they were then taken off into Babylon. They were exiled from their land. Until 70 years later, when a king named Cyrus 
would show up and lead God's people back to the promised land. So there's a sense in which Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in Cyrus. But the full and complete fulfillment would not come for another five to six hundred years later when another child would be born. A child king who would not get a a fancy cradle but would rather be laid in a, a cattle trough to sleep. This child would be no ordinary king. He would come from a royal line of David, yet he would be born of a virgin who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He would not grow to wear a gold crown with sparkling jewels and sit on a throne in Jerusalem, but rather he was enthroned with a crown of thorns and hung on a cross. This king, though he created the world, the Apostle John tells us that the world did not receive him. And Isaiah would later go on to talk about this baby who would come in Isaiah chapter 53 when he says this. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, no beauty that we should desire him. But he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But he was not this way because of weakness. This was the very plan of God the Father. This baby, this king, gives us hope because Isaiah continues in chapter 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So hope was born on Christmas morning because this baby, Jesus of Nazareth, would be the wise king, would be the mighty God incarnate, the one who restores perfect relationship that was broken all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 with his people, and the one through his death created this community of peace. Because of his person and because of his work, we no longer need to default into despair. We no longer have to live into the bondage of our fears. We no longer have to live as slaves to our sin. Jesus has come so that we can live with purpose and joy, regardless of whatever it is that the world brings to us. In Him we are healed. In Him our relationships are restored. In Him we can be forgiven. In Him there's no condemnation. In Him we have a future that is waiting for us. In Christ our broken lives can be made new. It's a dark world out there. But there's a reason why the weary world can rejoice. And it's because hope was born in Christ Jesus. And that hope can be yours. Not simply by just celebrating a season. But that hope can be yours by trusting in Christ. 
by giving Jesus your everything. This Christmas, will you give Jesus your full confidence? Will you give your life to him? Thanks for listening to this message from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. For more information about our church, you can find us on the web at www.emmanuelmora.com or on Facebook by searching for Emmanuel Mora. If you like what you've heard, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to partner with us in our mission, consider giving financially to our ministry. You can conveniently give right from your mobile device by texting any word to 320-313-1950. There are options for one-time giving or recurring gifts on the schedule that you set. Thanks again for listening. Emmanuel Mora, Knowing Christ and Making Him Known.